Coming up, the Royals still the biggest headline in town as they head to the World Series. Also grabbing the local headlines, Ebola. Despite a slew of scare stories centered on KU Hospital, there are no confirmed cases in the Metro. It's also not stopped the virus from becoming the new top issue in the race for U.S. Senate in Kansas. Plus, why aren't there more people of color on the police force? A major summit in Kansas City answers that question. And KCPT launches a brand new series on race in the Metro. We talk to the filmmaker. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more coming up on such an action-packed edition of the program. I'm wondering how we're going to fit it all in. Now, with us to dissect the stories on both sides of State Line in a pithy and insightful way from the Kansas City Star editorial board, Barbara Shelley, from News Radio 98.1 FM KMBZ, Scott Parks is with us, from the Call newspaper, senior writer Eric Wesson, and star political reporter, columnist and blogger Dave Helling. There have been rumors and concerns, front page stories, team coverage on radio and TV stations over Ebola in the metro. Yet there are no confirmed cases of the deadly disease in Kansas City and a man being treated at KU Hospital was actually suffering from a different medical condition. The alarm has not stopped our area politicians from getting in on the act. Senator Pat Roberts, fighting for his survival in Kansas, called on the president to order an immediate ban on flights from countries in West Africa. But how concerned is the senator with the virus? News reports surfaced this week that the senator, a member of the Senate Health Committee, skipped a special briefing with top public health officials on the current status of the virus and how they were fighting it. That news development came out just as the Topeka Capital Journal reported that the senator from Kansas missed two-thirds of his Agriculture Committee meetings since 2000. So what's the senator's response to that, Dave Helling? Well, he, on Ebola, he has said that the hearing that he missed was out of session, is the way he put it, and that they didn't really deal with anything that was important. So he sort of suggested it wasn't an important hearing to cover. He's also said, and people who study Congress understand that committee hearings, you know, attendance can be a bit misleading. Sometimes they're very routine, mundane matters that you don't necessarily have to attend. But it is of a piece of the criticism broadly of Roberts that he has lost touch with Kansas and that he is not on the job for important things. You don't have idea. to be in a key Ebola meeting in Washington to get a briefing on this to know about the virus? Not Scott? if you're fighting for your political life back at home. Um, it, it may read well for a day against Pat Roberts, um, and, and I've had some concerns about uh, about Pat Roberts and whether or not he should remain the senator from, from the state of Kansas. But uh, Pat Roberts is, you know, Dave and I were talking just before the show, for the first time in his congressional career, he's actually having to fight. He's finally learning what it's like to have somebody who may take what you've got. And so I think he's going to have to stay in Kansas and, yes, miss some meetings back at, in Washington. Barbara. I'm of the mind that if you're going to propose a travel ban on an entire half of a continent, you should go to the briefing to find out what's going on before you propose such a drastic measure. We have had one African confirmed with Ebola in the United States, and now our politicians are saying, oh, we have to, you know, shut down travel to thousands of people who probably have good and in some cases urgent re reasons to get here. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's demagoguing an issue. But I'm astounded, though, by the sort of public fear and anxiety mm -hmm. over this issue. And this is why I've topped this story on, on this program, mm -hmm. because the anxiety that I hear, even from Kansas Cityans, even though we have absolutely no reported cases mm -hmm. of this confirmed in Kansas City, is seems to be one of the top issues on people's minds. Um, isn't that the case, Barbara? Oh, you know, I hear different things. You know, you, you hear people worried about it, and other, others are saying, oh, it's very hard to catch. Um, you know, but people are scared of illnesses, and especially an illness that we don't understand and that, that is, you know, could very well be fatal. But if you really look at it, that you know, it's, it's not easily contracted. Um, as I say, we have one African, and the, the other cases in the United States are health care workers. Um, you know, I... I, I I think people are not yeah. overreacting. Well, go ahead, Eric, and then I'll respond. Uh, I think one of the anxieties are that people have a general consensus that it's airborne. 
and nobody from Centers of Disease Control or the experts in the field are saying that. So I think that's where the anxiety is because people are looking at exchanging fluids with someone, having someone cough or sneeze on you, or being on an airplane where that air is recycled. So I think one of the biggest fears, of course, has to be people's not having the education that they need to be able to prevent the disease from coming. Like 36,000 people last year died of flu-related um, illnesses right. and in the United States. And as the KU hospital was talking about this week, that you'd be better off trying to put your seatbelt on than be worrying about the Ebola virus, Dave well, Helling. And I wrote a column this week that suggested broadly that the United States spends far much mo um, um, more money on defense matters like tanks and armies and jets for the perceived threat from ISIS or other terrorists than they do from disease and sickness in the United States. And I do think we're on the verge of a real discussion about that. We spend about $30 billion a year on research through the uh, National Institutes of Health. It's far more likely you'll die of the flu or heart disease or cancer than it will from a terror attack. And you do get the sense that some Americans want to want to revisit that that ratio, if you will, of stunning. Just briefly, though, the the problem is in part you have a, a government that is speaking out of both sides of its mouth. The CDC director, the president, both saying it's not airborne. Yet yesterday on CNN, General Martin Dempsey, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, says, I'm not convinced, these were his, uh, paraphrased words, I'm not convinced it's not an airborne disease. Mm -hmm. So whom are we to believe? And then the image is everything. And you have the CDC director and the president uh, saying it's not an airborne disease, yet when they wheel these people out to planes, it looks like the scene from E.T. when they find him. <laughs> And they shut that house down because they don't know what mm -hmm. they've got. And, and yeah. I think it's natural for people to fear what they don't know. And admittedly, we don't know everything about this disease. And so I think the anxiety or the fear, I would put, use the word concern, uh, is understandable to some extent. But I don't think the media is to blame. I th a lot of people are blaming the media for fueling this hysteria. People drive the media. The media does not drive people. I don't know. On CNN last night, they had a helicopter trailing the ambulance that the nurse from was Dallas OJ. was yeah. in. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, 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 I kind of think that's overkill, personally. Okay, well, we do have other stories in the news this week. The boys in blue remain the biggest story in town as they head to their first World Series in almost 30 years. Kansas City Chamber head Jim Hida on his blog writes that you cannot buy this kind of PR. An economist at the Mid-America Regional Council claimed every game is like a three-hour commercial for our community. The Washington Post dubbed the Royals America's team, a moniker picked up by news outlets and bloggers from as far away as London. Even the St. Louis Post-Dispatch called the team Destiny's Darlings. Last week, we mentioned how the KCPD had witnessed a dip in crime in this postseason. <laughs> Where else are we noticing the Royals' difference this week, Scott? Uh, for the first time in the 28 years that I've lived in this town, uh, people are actually talking about the Royals in October and not the Chiefs. And uh, it, it's exciting. I mean, there is a buzz going on. And baseball is, it, it's not unique to baseball. But with their championship, if you can get to it, you get to host it. And I, I agree with Jim Heater. You can't buy the kind of PR that we're going to be getting uh, in the next two weeks. Eric. And you go into grocery stores and there's that... Uh, Royals t-shirts on sale in grocery stores and they're selling this they're, they're saying that they're selling more Royals gear than they are groceries and it's good for the city uh, economically people when it rained out that one day and people had to stay over that was additional income uh, it, it's great for the city and it's good here's my old fogey moment and, and really a clue, a secret clue to people who don't know about how journalism works. When something like this happens in a community, reporters from radio, television, and newspapers all sit in a room and go, what angles can we report on this story? What's Let's do economic impact. What does it mean for crime? How are we selling shirts? What does it mean for PR across the country? My old fogey moment is maybe it's more important for us just to enjoy it for what it is, which is good baseball, fun to watch, people are excited, and not worry about what the ancillary benefits or detractions of it are. That's me. Okay, he's being an old fogey over there then. All right. <laughs> We're all old Barbara, fogies come on. this table, right? I 
don't see any downside to being in the World Series. It gives everybody something to talk about, something in common. You know. How, how about yeah. one downside? It was interesting this week. I got a call from the PBS News Hour saying, "Oh, I mean, they were w interested in what we were doing relating to the two elections in Kansas, the governor's race and the U.S. Senate race. It must be everything. Everybody's talking about that, right?" And I said, "Well, you know, really, people are talking about the Royals. Isn't it having a knock-on effect on this election? Isn't there going to be a Royals factor that people are not going to know as much one. about these elections?" Yeah, but uh, people are paying attention to elections later and later in the cycle okay. anyway, particularly undecided voters. The World Series will be over about a week before Election Day. Plenty of time for folks. All righty. By the way, we get a quirky inside take on the Royals postseason from a KCPT super fan in a video journal. You can see it at our website, kcpt.org slash royal hyphen journey. Now, according to the Missouri Attorney General, one of the big lessons of Ferguson, Missouri, is the crisis in representative policing. And Chris Costa says Missouri needs to provide scholarships or loan forgiveness programs to encourage more minorities to become police officers in the state. That was one of the findings he came away with this week after bringing together around 100 top law enforcement officials and community leaders at a summit at UMKC. Two thirds of Ferguson's citizens are black, but nearly all of Ferguson's police officers are white. In Kansas City, blacks make up nearly 30% of residents, but only 11% of the city's police force. In Grandview, 40% of the city's residents are black, but blacks represent less than 2% of that suburb's police department. So is providing scholarships and loan forgiveness programs the answer, Eric? No, yes and no. Uh, I think, one, you have to create the climate where people understand that their presence and the diversity on the police department is important. What gets me about this process with uh, the attorney general is he's been getting uh, reports every year since he's been attorney general on disparities in these police departments. Now suddenly it's an issue that we need to be paying attention to. He's been attorney general for what, about six years? He gets these racial profiling reports every year. Now he wants to do something about it around the corner from running from well, the hey, governor. Republicans are already sending out emails <laughs> noting that Chris Coster's own staff is almost entirely Caucasian. Exactly. He has, I think, one African American or one minority out of 30, 35 people on his staff. So there is some other hypocrisy that may be directed at the uh, Democratic uh, candidate. But going should forward. he be criticized for trying to make a difference here, Scott? I don't know if he should be criticized for it. Um, and I'm with Eric. I mean, the ideas are meh. But it, I, I've always had an issue, though, with these arguments that, well, Two-thirds of Ferguson is black, but only four or five, I can't remember the exact number, of their police officers are black. Well, should Ferguson go out and make their police force two-thirds black? And where do you get the candidates from? You know, the, the problem also is in the inner city to an extent, and, you know, I, I know that there are people at this table who could probably profess about this better than I could, but at least it's my impression that within the inner city, it, there's sort of this no snitch thing. If you're if you snitch somebody out to the cops, then then you know you're the lowest of the low. Well, one of the ideas is to create sort of a charter magnet school or something, as, as I understand it, where they would be kind of pushed in the direction of law enforcement. Well, what if an inner city kid goes to that charter magnet school? What's their mm -hmm. reputation going to be back in their neighborhood? Is it going to be a problem for them? If so, they're not going to be going to that school. And so. And. And, okay, go ahead. Just to the point, though, you know, of course, police departments, it's good for police departments to be increasing their percentage of minority officers, especially if you have a high percentage of minority citizens. You don't want your police to look like an occupying force in the neighborhoods that they're protecting and serving. Um, you know, student loans, it's, is it the answer? It, it's one of the answers, but, you know, they need to do a lot of things, and, you know, and it actually starts with rebuilding or creating better relationships in the neighborhood to start with so you don't have the dynamic that you it, just it, talked it, about. It begins with people registering to vote and then mm -hmm. casting ballots for city council members or others who will reflect the views of the community in terms of policing and other policies. That, that's where the power lies in the power of the vote. And that's where you really get the kind of diversity, maybe regardless of race, that might help places like Ferguson. And, and another issue that you have in the black community and you have with law enforcement is 
association with ex-felons and in a lot of situations you would have and I think Forte changed that rule within Kansas City you go to a family reunion and you might have a cousin that just got out of prison for selling weed or something and then that's an association that you have right there that you can't avoid so now when they come in do they say I gotta snitch my cousin out and arrest them because they're doing something illegal or do I go along with the family so it's a kind of a cultural thing too and I'm not saying all uh, African Americans have this problem but it's more prevalent in black communities and households and families than it is anywhere else. Could we heal our police community relations in this community by naming a new police station after a black man? Next up, the power of a name, Leon Jordan, an African-American police detective and political leader who was shot to death in 1970. Is it fitting to put his name on the new Eastside Police Patrol building and crime lab going up at East 27th Street and Prospect Avenue. The mayor fears if they say yes to putting a name on the police building, it would mean renaming more than 100 buildings in Kansas City. Social justice advocates like Alvin Sykes says the move would humanize the police department. Putting the name of a black man on this building would say a lot about how far we've come in police and community relations. So given all we've talked about, Eric, wouldn't this be a powerful, send a powerful political message? Absolutely. Uh, Leon Jordan was very instrumental in law enforcement to begin with most people connecting with freedom but there was law enforcement that he was affiliated with in fact he went overseas and helped create a police department but we've got schools named after people we've got federal buildings named after people we've got all of these why not the Leon Jordan East Patrol if the mayor's position is to uh, name the police department or keep it within that zone, Leon Jordan East Patrol would be a, a fitting tribute to him because the, the post office there that was on Prospect closed, so that was the Leon Jordan post office. I, I should point out that there are other names being proposed for the building. Here are some of them on your screen here, including anti-crime activist and former city councilman Alvin Brooks. You can see more of them on your screen there, including Royal Second Baseman Frank White, but is there an objection to just Jordan or a name in general? And it, what is the other side to this, Barbara? Yeah, none of the other police stations are named after anyone. It's just Metro Patrol, Central Patrol, North Patrol, South Patrol, etc. Um, yeah, I'm not crazy about the idea of naming the station after Leon Jordan. He he was in law enforcement, but he also had some um, ties to organized crime that the cops don't want it, a lot of them. And, you know, I, I just don't see that. Now, Alvin Sykes, the social mm -hmm. justice advocate, yeah. said that Harry Truman himself had ties to organized crime yes. with Tom Pendergast, <laughs> yes, and we don't take his name off of buildings. <laughs> that's a good well, argument. Did you know, I, I, what I, did Hoover yeah, do? I, I, mean, I suppose that's a legitimate <laughs> argument, but I don't know, as I say, you get back to the point that the other police yes. stations aren't named after someone. Scott, do you have an <laughs> yeah. opinion on this? I don't have a problem with them naming the building after Mr. Jordan, and, and I don't buy the, the argument that if we name one building after it, then we've got a hundred other buildings. Well, the power to do that is in the city council and, and with the, ver the mayor himself. If they don't want to name any more buildings they don't have to the other reason it might be important to name this building is because of the uh, disappointment in some parts of the community over how this entire process was handled how homes were condemned how the location was chosen it might help uh, some attitudes if they reach out to the community and say look we're going to try and reflect you as we go forward now, Chris Christie was back on the campaign trail for Kansas Governor Sam Brownback this week. The outspoken New Jersey governor was here just a few weeks ago chowing down on barbecue with Brownback. This time it was to enjoy an afternoon cold treat at a Kansas branch of the burger and frozen custard chain Freddy's. Uh, governor Christie, like me, likes to eat. And this is good stuff. When I was in Kansas City, took him to barbecue here, coming to Freddy's. Is this cavalcade of political names and culinary delectables moving the needle any for the Kansas governor, Barbara? I have no idea, but, um, <laughs> you know, you know, I guess if people want to see Chris Christie or Paul Ryan was in this week campaigning for Pat Roberts or whatever, they'll go out and see him and maybe tell their friends about it. You know, I suppose there's not a downside. I just don't know how much it helps. Does it make a difference, Scott? I don't think it hurts. I mean... A lot of Republicans like Chris Christie, Paul Ryan, they don't, they don't dislike him. I think what it does, though, is it, it speaks volumes to how close 
uh, or upside down some of these races are for Republican candidates who would have thought this close to the election two and a half weeks out that that Sam Brownback would need Chris Christie to come to Kansas twice well, one of the oldest uh, tropes in politics is to get endorsements and Pat Roberts is even more shameless about this bringing in John McCain and Sarah Palin and a lot of other people and in every debate performance I've been endorsed by the chamber and the NFIB and all these other people I, I think endorsements have always been overblown in politics it's hard to believe that someone is supporting Paul Davis and then sees Chris Christie and says you know what I'm changing my vote to Sam <laughs> Brownback on that basis alone now endorsements help raise money they bring some legitimacy but in terms of actually moving votes I don't think they're very effective you know rather than heading to Freddy's Christie and Brownback might have visited a Russell Stover factory this week so they could sample another locally made sweet treat but not any longer did you hear the news it's official Russell Stover is now Swiss the deal finally inked this week with chocolatier Lint so Boulevard is now Belgian AMC is Chinese Sprint is Japanese and Russell Stover Swiss what's left we still have our barbecue. That's pretty authentic. Yes, and we've taken the Oklahoma name yeah, off of it, we, so we yeah, do have that. So we still made have, some ground there. We still have Gates. Mm -hmm. And we have the Kansas City Royals, even though its second place hitter is Nori Aoki, who is joining us on these shores as well. All right. <laughs> Finally, KCPT launches next week a brand new series on race, immigration, and the American dream. And we want you to join us as we go inside the homes and around the dinner tables of local families as they share their stories with us. I don't believe the American dream. I think it is hard to be an Asian in America today. Your Fellow Americans is a project asking questions about race, immigration, and the American dream. We're just trying to figure out what it means to be American for as many different folks as possible. I am a biracial person with a black mom and a white dad. In my life, because my skin is darker than paper, <laughs> really, I'm mostly identified by the outside world as someone who's African American. There becomes a comfortability where I'm with my friends and I'm joking and I'm like, oh, let's do makeup, but then they go to put on foundation and it's like, oh, that's definitely not gonna fit my color. Is it frustrating? Yes, it can be very frustrating in that sometimes I don't feel like I fit in really either race. Me and my brothers are. We're all biracial, but telling my brother, my older brother, that he is biracial, you wouldn't be able to. My younger brother can't be picked up by my mom sometimes because people don't believe that he belongs to her. So it really does cause you to have to roll with the punches and to not be so set in the ground that you can't be moved. I am. As I get older, I, I have less of a filter. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want her to have to hear that junk. An excerpt from the new KCPT online series on race called Your Fellow Americans, launching on kcpt.org this Monday. Popping in for a moment from editing the series is filmmaker Christopher Cook, who also brought us We Are Superman about mm -hmm. the Truce Corridor. We very much appreciate you joining us. What is the purpose of the series, Christopher? Well, Nick, the purpose of the Your Fellow Americans series is really just to try to enable discussion. Uh, we're visiting families in their homes, asking them to talk about their experiences on race, immigration, and how those impact the American dream, with the hope that when people view it, um, it'll make them think about it and uh, enable them to have those conversations. Nobody likes to have conversations about race. Mayor James said that at the UMKC summit meeting this week on the, uh, on the police and minorities, Eric. Absolutely. That's one of the taboo subjects that we talk about. That's one of those things that's right there in your face. So we just saw just one little aspect of it, but we're mm -hmm. going to be seeing a lot more of these families. Uh, what has been the biggest surprise thus far in putting this together? Well, to be, to be honest, Nick, uh, one of the biggest surprises has been sometimes the gratitude in people when we approach them uh, and ask them to share their stories, the, the gratitude in you know, the fact that we want to hear their stories and share it. Uh, so I think there's a lot of power in just wanting to, to talk about these issues and wanting to hear what their experiences have been. Um, so that's, I'd say that's been the biggest surprise. Now, we're giving people an opportunity to be part of the series as well. So mm -hmm. what, what are you actually looking for? What type of families are you looking for who can t take part in the series? Well, the series uh, right now is going to run for six months initially. Uh, we're going to be visiting... This is a huge investment of our time. Yeah, a, a lot of time. Uh, and uh, we have four families lined up, but there, we're still looking for two more families, uh, preferably multi-generation, a grandparent, a parent, and maybe some teenagers. 
uh, that we can visit, come into their homes, join them around the dinner table, and just see what their experiences have been. Uh, right now we're looking for some Hispanic families or some Islamic families in the Kansas City area. So if anybody is interested or, or knows of families who might be interested, contact us at KCPT. Okay, we're going to put the website on the bottom of the screen so you can see that. Uh, your own comments, Barbara, are about, um, I mean, race is a complicated issue. People don't like to have this conversation. Yeah, but this project sounds, it sounds great. It sounds like something people can really get invested in. Okay. The, the, the central issue in Kansas City has long been race. It, uh, virtually every issue we have, education, taxes, crime, health, are all ultimately racial issues in this community. We're not unique in that respect. Most urban areas have the same problem. But to the extent that it can be discussed and addressed, uh, it will be healthy for us. And our bring the camera probably. into people's kitchens yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. living rooms. And, and yeah. that helps with the perception because mm -hmm. a lot of our racial problems that we have here are perceptions and misperceptions that we have of each other. All righty, Christopher, thank you so much for being with us on this program. That is our Week in Review. Our thanks to the stars Barbara Shelley and Eric Wesson of The Call, to Dave Helling, and to filmmaker Christopher Cook, who looks an awful lot like Scott Parks did a few minutes ago. Yes, but Scott Parks, 50% of Dana and Parks, 2 to 6 on 98.1 FM KMBZ. Next week, Ed Eilert and Patricia Leitner square off on this program in the Johnson County leadership debate. And then immediately afterwards, join us for Kobach versus Shodoff, the race for Kansas Secretary of State. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at KCPT, we thank you for spending part of your weekend with us.